Okay. I think we are going live and it's almost time <clears throat> to start our readings for History Happy Hour. Brought to you from my armchair in my office. Hello, I see I have one person watching right now, so it must be close to starting time. And here it is. We are starting live with the History of Rye, New Hampshire continuation, written by L.B. Parsons. And it is Mother's Day, May 11th, 2020. Happy Mother's Day to everybody out there. And to our mothers who are not with us anymore, happy Mother's Day to them. And with that, I'll say here's a toast to you. Happy Sunday. Today, we are going to pick up <clears throat> on chapter 12 of Parsons. And it's about the industrial and uh, miscellaneous factors here in Rye. Industrial and miscellaneous. Rye Harbor. It is said that the harbor was formerly between Loch Neck and the eastern end of the stones, that a trunk was put in and an outlet or harbor dug out about 1756 from the deep hole, as it used to be called, but the present harbor was not dug out and completed until 1792. Before this harbor has, was opened, it was a thatch pond and marsh, and it was alder swamp. <clears throat> in May of 1792, the town voted a committee to dig out Rye Harbor between Ragged Neck and Little Neck and appointed a committee of seven to dig out where they think it a proper. At a legal meeting, chose Samuel Jenis, moderator, to hear a report of committee chosen to view the harbor betwixt Little Neck and Ragged Neck. At said meeting, chose Nathan Goss, Simon Jenis, Captain Joseph Jenis, John Garland, John Webster, Reuben Philbrook, and Jeremiah Berry, a committee to dig out a harbor where they think proper. The following are the subscriptions or work to complete the harbor. And this is dated in April 9th, 1792. And it goes on to list um, a number of, whew, probably 30 different gentlemen and how many days they worked, one day, two days, seven days, the one that I find a couple of that are interesting, Nathan Goss, he worked 15 days and he received 10 gallons of rum. Also, um, Jeremiah Berry and Benjamin Marden are noted with their oxen for three days, four days, uh, six days, so 13 days um, to use the oxen to help dig out the harbor. Wharf at Sandy Beach, December 17, 1763, an act was passed appointing Francis Jenis, Ozum Dowerst, Joseph Brown, Jenis Marden, and Jeremiah Locke as a committee to construct a wharf to prevent the tide from destroying Sandy Beach. No record of the action was taken by the committee, uh, if they took any, or whether the wharf was built at the expense of the province or the town or at the joint expense of both, nothing's been found. Vessels owned in Rye. After Rye Harbor was dug out, numerous small boats were engaged in the fisheries and later on schooners of 30 and 40 tons did considerable fishing business during the summer season and during the fall and winter freighted potatoes, hay, apples, and other products to market. And many of the citizens at that time availed themselves of this mode of conveyance to make their first trip to Boston. Fish houses were erected at Ragged Neck and also at Little Neck. All the fish were caught with hand lines and after being salted and dried were shipped to various markets. Uh, it goes on to list uh, a fleet of vessels at that point in time, um, different schooners and their captains. The schooners named being Rye, Register, Sarah, Tabithia, Fly, Two Brothers, Echo, Globe, Otis, Four Brothers, Tyro, and Eagle. Vessels wrecked. Many vessels have been wrecked on our coast. In, 16, in 1764, 
A schooner and a brig came ashore. In 1768, a schooner captained by Captain Grindiff came ashore and was a total wreck. Uh, it goes on to list from that point in time through 1882, um, all the different schooners or various schooners that came ashore. Um, we're gonna go on to the electric railway. Rye is off the line of the steam railroad between Boston and Portsmouth, the former Eastern Railroad, now a part of the Eastern Division of the Great Boston and Main System. And the inhabitants of the town have always depended and the summer hotels and summer visitors now depend upon the stations of that railroad in Northampton, Greenland and Portsmouth for their railroad facilities. The large stagecoaches of the house of the hotels being regular attendants at one or of the other of those stations at train time throughout the season of summer visitation to the beaches. There is nothing in prospect that will ever bring a steam road any nearer that town than the Boston and Maine is now. Rye will always be off to one side of any line of steam communications and it may be doubted if a railway of any kind would ever have run its cars within the borders of the town, but for the marvelous advance of the application of electricity as a motive power for the cars of street railways. A petition for the location of tracks, etc., by the Boston and Maine's intermediary, the Portsmouth and Dover Railroad, was presented as follows to the selectment of Ryan. I'm only going to read a bit of it because it goes on for quite a while in quite a bit of detail. I'm just going to get to the paragraphs that kind of summarize it in the book, not my summaries. The directors of the Portsmouth and Dover Railroad, a corporation duly established under the laws of this state and having its principal office at Portsmouth in said county, respectfully represent that the Supreme Court of this state upon the petition of said railroad and proper proceedings had thereon, has determined that the public good requires that an extension and branches and additions to its steam railroad to be operated by electricity be built in certain streets and highways of said town and upon and over the routes and public streets and highways in said town. And at the end of the petition, it goes, upon the petition, a hearing was held at the town hall on January 31st, 1899. And after listening to the statements and arguments of all who desired to be heard, the selectmen voted to grant the prayer of the petition, both for the main line from its junction with the tracks at the Portsmouth boundary on Sagamore Road to Rye Center and the Wallace Sand Loop from Lang's Corner. And they also specified on which side of the highway the track should be laid, sometimes on one side, sometimes on the other side, on both main line and loop. But it was not the intention of the railroad management to make a terminal at Rye Center. And later, another petition was filed with the selectmen asking for the location of tracks and poles for an extension over a route. And the description will follow in a little bit. I'm not gonna read that petition. On this later petition, several hearings were held at the town hall, at the conclusion of which the selectmen granted the request locating the tracks on the easterly side of the highway from the meeting house to opposite the house of the late N. Gilbert Jenis, and on the westerly side of the remainder of the distance to the fish houses and the Northampton line. Among the conditions imposed by the selectmen were that the railroad should be built and maintain its parts of all culverts and bridges over which its tracks should be laid, that in case of dispute over the grade of any highway or portion thereof, the selectmen for the time being should have the right to determine the grade and that any change of grade ordered by the selectmen should be made by the railroad and at its expense and that no trees should be cut down or trimmed by the railway except by permission of the selectmen and under their direction. The railway extends through the town very nearly its entire length from north to south, and the route as granted and built upon being in the following named roads. From the Portsmouth line on Sagamore Road through Sagamore, Wallace and Washington roads to the center, and from the center through Central, Causeway, and Farragut roads to the Northampton line. The Wallace Sands Loop still awaits construction. On the 1st of April, 1899, 
A gang of railway construction laborers commenced digging up the ground near the center, another gang starting at the other end on Sagamore Road at the Portsmouth Line. On the 24th of August, the first car was run over the line to Lang's Corner. And then it continues on um, different months, how they progress until we get to um, all of the cars were up and running on July 14th, running smoothly all the way down to Northampton Depot and over the branch. The railway, as was promised, should be the case, was built in the best possible manner. Rails heavier than are ordinarily used on electric railways are put in, and when the line was finished, the Boston and Maine civil engineers, under whose supervision the line was built, said that as far as anything giving away was concerned, it would be perfectly safe to run the road, railroad's heaviest locomotive over it. And then we're gonna skip forward a little bit. Hi everybody, thanks for watching. I'm gonna have a sip of wine right now and I suggest that you also enjoy whatever you're having for happy hour. Happy hour, mothers, from Debbie to you. And we had snow this weekend, flurries Saturday morning. But to continue on with our railroad. This railway transports great numbers of people to and from Hampton Beach during the summer and is patronized to the considerable extent by the summer visitors that arrive. Since it was built, quite a number of Portsmouth businessmen have had cottages erected at some of Rye's beaches, where during the warm months, they pass the nights with their families, the electrics taking them to Portsmouth in the morning in time for the day's business. And early morning cars run every working day, which enables many Rye mechanics to have employment in Portsmouth or at the Navy Yard and be at their homes every night. And its cars are a great convenience for many of the farmers of Rye and their families throughout the year. A submerged forest is the next section. <clears throat> Excuse me. Off the easterly or northerly, as the reader prefers, end of Genis Beach, can be seen at extremely low tides, 150 feet or more from high water mark, the remains of what was once a forest of large trees in the shape of great stumps, that in the course of many years, perhaps of centuries, have been grounded down almost to their roots by the actions of the sand-laden waves, but which are still held in the positions in which they grew by their huge gnarled roots with a tenacity which the mighty force of the ocean in its wildest moods has never been able to overcome. These stumps, <clears throat> excuse me, these stumps of cedar and other varieties of trees are hidden from sight at ordinarily low tides. Sometimes a very low tide, but few of them are visible, the larger number being covered with a covering of sand, which will be washed clear of them by the next storm from the right direction. How far the stumps extend out under the sea is unknown, the tide never having receded far enough to disclose the outer edge of the group. That there was a heavy growth of trees there at some time long ago is evident. But how long ago, neither history nor tradition informs us. The place where they, grown, where they grew was then dry land, dry that is, so far as the ocean is considered. For trees of their kind do not thrive or even live in localities where their roots are frequently covered with salt water. The forest must have disappeared before the advent of the first settlers, for had it been, submerged after their arrival, even by the gradual encroachment of the sea upon its site, it certainly would have been received mention in the writings of somebody. The submergence may have been due to a sudden subsidence, sorry, subsidence of the coast, but this was a mere speculation. All that can be said positively of the stumps is that they are still there. Even when they were first discovered is not known. One of Rye's oldest residents of about 50 years ago, being asked about them, replied, Why? Everybody in Rye always knew they were there. And I can tell you that about every five years here in current days, uh, the tides will be low enough and the sand is washed out enough that you do get to see at the north end of um, the beach, in that area of Genesis Beach, 
that you can see stumps and you can see their roots and sometimes it's a lot sometimes it's just a peak sometimes they're there for a couple of days the last time that i remember seeing them they were there for almost two full weeks being visible before the sands were the tides brought the sands in and covered them up again in the accompanying illustration, which I will try to show you right now without losing all my various things, but there's the illustration of the stumps, and it also shows the cable, which is the next section that we're going to be talking about. Uh, can be seen the direct United States Cable Company's cable washed out of the sand by a heavy sea, showing close to the stumps. The cable station. On the southerly side of Locks Neck, quite near the Rye Beach Life Saving Station, is the receiving station of the cable of the Direct United States Cable Company, a neat but neither large nor pretentious building. This company's cable, at the time it was completed in 1874, was the only ocean telegraph cable having one end in Europe and the other on the shore of the United States. And it was from this circumstance that the company took its name of Direct Cable Company. Previously, cables had all made their land connections on the westerly side of the Atlantic in the British provinces, all messages being sent from there to their destinations in the United States by overland wires. Even the direct cable does not come direct to the United States, it touching first at Halifax, Nova Scotia, from which place a cable 540 nautical miles in length extends to Rye Beach, the company's main cable, from Halifax to Ballingskelligs Bay, Ireland, being 2,564 miles long, marking the total length of cable between the Irish coast and Rye Beach, 3,104 miles. The direct cable was laid by the steamer Faraday, which was built expressly for the purpose and subsequently laid at least six other cable Atlantic, other Atlantic cables. In laying the direct cable, the Faraday was assisted by steamers Ambassador and Dacia. The short cable, as the sections between Rye Beach and Halifax is called, was the first laid. And the shore end at Rye Beach was landed on Wednesday, July 15, 1874, in connection made with the end of the cable that had been buoyed off the Isles of Shoals a week or more earlier. The landing of the shore end had been announced to take place several days before it did. And on that day, many thousands of expectant watchers gathered along the shore, but only to be disappointed because dense fogs entered the shoreline and the eastern eastward preventing the arrival on time of the steamer ambassador, which was to land the shore end and make the connection of the cable already laid by the Faraday. And let me tell you, when the fog comes in here, it comes in. You can't see your hand in front of you on an occasion. Notwithstanding this delay and disappointment, the interest aroused by the arrival in Portsmouth Lower Harbor on Sunday, July 12th of the ambassador was intense. And when the vessel steamed out to a position about 1,500 yards off of Locks Neck on Tuesday afternoon and came to anchor there, a throng of people numbering many thousands on foot, horseback, and in carriages was waiting along the shore to assist in the exercises as spectators and a party of enthusiasts who brought two small cannon from Kittery to fire a salute of 100 guns as soon as the shore end was landed were all ready to begin their share of the celebration at any moment. But there was a vast amount of work yet to be done before the cable could be set ashore. And as night came on, the crowd gradually thinned out until by midnight, very little of it remained. On Wednesday morning, the shore section of the cable, weighing 15 tons, was loaded from the steamer upon a platform and then upon two steam launches and out and at about three o'clock in the afternoon, the shore end of it was successfully landed amid the booming of cannon and the enthusiastic cheers of the faithful few who had remained to see the work completed. It took about an hour to place the cable in the trench that had been dug to receive it. Quite a number of ladies taking hold of the rope attached to the cable and assisting to drag it to high watermark and the work of splicing took about two hours more. 
Then the ambassador's guns reply, replied to the ones on shore. Rockets were set up from the ship and blue lights burned and there were hearty cheerings by the crowd that had once been attracted to the beach. The sea was as smooth as a mill pond all through the day, which greatly favored the work and no mishaps of any kind occurred. And thus was completed the landing of the first Atlantic cable to be landed in the United States soil. After finishing her work on shore, the ambassador waited anchor at about nine, half past nine o'clock. My little friend just joined me. I've got a kitty over here. Uh, nine o'clock that evening, proceeded to the shoals and picked up the cable there and made the splice. The entire line was completed and open for business early in September following and has been doing its fair share of international telegraphing ever since. Now there are many cables that landed in the United States, including the French cable, which lands at Duxbury, Mass, and the Mackay-Bennett cable, which lands at Rockport, Mass. But cable lay laying no longer attracts the share of public notice and business transactions like what we had here in Rye. And even the completion not long ago of the commercial cable from San Francisco to the Hawaiian and Philippine Islands, the only ocean cable, uh-oh, <laughs> that has both its terminals on United States tory, territory and what is wholly under American control, did not receive the press of the country such extended and detailed reports as were given 30 years ago to the landing of the shore and of the direct United States cable at Rye Beach. Life-saving station. And I thank everybody who's watching. Thank you. Life-saving station service is a term specifically used to designate organized effort and equipment for the saving of life in cases of upon ship shipwreck upon or near the seashore of the United States or the shores of the Great Lakes and the buildings where the trained crews of the service with their boats and other appliances are housed are termed life-saving stations. The Danish government supports about 50 such stations and the Belgian government a few. With these exceptions, the life-saving service of the United States is the only government established service of any kind of the world. Even the lifeboat service of Great Britain being entirely in the hands of the British, the Royal National Lifeboat Institution, a corporation depending entirely upon voluntary contributions for its support and the maintenance of its benefit efforts. The number of stations maintained in the United States is now nearing the 300 mark, the number in 1900 having been 268. This great number being necessitated by the vast extent of this country's coast on the Atlantic and Pacific coasts, oceans, the Gulf of Mexico and the Great Lakes. New sta stations are established every year, but there are still many stretches and some of them long ones of dangerous coasts not thus guarded. And if every place where a station is really needed had one, the number would probably be, be several times greater than it is. Not only is life-saving service in this country the most extensive in the world, but it is a matter of which every American justly can take pride that is conceded by the maritime experts of all countries to be the best and most efficient. No other country has so extensive and continuous a system of beach patrol and many of the most important appliances, including the gun for shooting a line over a wreck, are of American invention. The station buildings are houses, a story and a half high, having from six to eight rooms and supplied with every modern appliance from rendering aid, lifeboats, surf boats, line throwing guns, housers, hauling lines, life cars, breech buoys, etc. A station crew consists of a captain and six, seven, eight surfmen, and the captain's duty continuing the year through while the surfmen serve but 10 months being discharged on the 31st day of May to be reinstated, perhaps, on the 1st of August following. A very short-sighted procedure on the part of the government. Neither sensible, nor generous, nor just. Apparently our author was not happy about that and he goes on for quite a while. I'm going to skip that. And I'm going to get to, of the four life-saving stations on New Hampshire's short line of seacoast, two are in Rye Beach or excuse me, two are in Rye, one Rye Beach and the Wallace Sand Stations. Another 
the Jaffrey's Point Station, which is in Southeast Point of Great Island, and the fourth, the Hampton Beach Station, which is near Great Boar's Head's its name is changed as the shore of Hampton, a mile and a half northerly of Great Boar's Head. The Rye Beach Station, established in 1873 and the first built of the four, was originally located near the northerly end of Genis Beach, but in 1890, a larger and more modern house was erected on the southerly side of Locks Neck. The Wallace Sand Station, established in 1890, is located about the middle of the beach, from which it takes its name, one and three quarters miles southerly from Odeorn's Point, to which point the patrol of the surfmen of this station extends. You can say that here in Rye, you can still see uh, the life rescue station on Genis Beach. And where we're coming up in 25 minutes, I'm going to skip a little bit and because this is a long chapter with lots of different nooks and crannies, but I would like to tell you a little bit about uh, the cruise, uh, there, what a night is like. Thus, throughout the entire night and every hour of the night, for 10 months of the year, hardy men are traveling back and forth over every mile of the coast between Hampton River and Odeorn's Point. The worse the storm, the darker the night, the more imperative the necessity of the faithful performance of the patrol duty, and during howling winter gales, when the comfortable citizen would consider it a serious hardship, did he have to step out of his warm house to cross the street, the surfman, battling with the tempest, the snow, and the stinging sleet from the boisterous sea, makes his laborious way over the uncertain footing in the inky darkness to the end of his patrol, keenly watching seaward all the time for any signs of a wreck, or perchance for a sight of some vessel rushing into unexpected danger, whose crew he can warn of their peril by burning his coston light. To begrudge such men two months of easy duty during the pleasant summer season seems really dishonorably mean. Again, our author was not pleased with that. We go on to destructive storms. And there is a petition. The following is a petition from the Selectmen of Rye through the provincial government of 1754 praying for relief from taxation on account of the town having suffered greatly from a severe storm. Province of New Hampshire. To His Excellency Benning Wentworth, Esquire, Governor, and Commander-in-Chief in and over His Majesty's, Majesty's Province of New Hampshire, and the Honorable the House of Representatives for said province now in general court sitting. I love this. Humbly shrews. James Marden and Joseph Philbrook, two of the selectmen of the parish of Rye in the province aforesaid, being the major part thereof in behalf of said parish, that on or about the 19th day of June last past, there was a violent thunderstorm, and there fell a very considerable quantity of rain and hail, which reached throughout the said parish and damaged all of the inhabitants of said parish. Three or four families only were accepted. Very much shattering their homes and barns, breaking the glass windows, almost one and a half throughout the said parish, shattered the meeting house and parish house and broke the glass thereof, that 100 pounds of old tenor will not be sufficient to repair the said meeting house and parish house. Destroyed almost all the apples of the parish with almost all the English and Indian corn then and there standing in the growing of one half of said inhabitants, by means whereof the said inhabitants are reduced to miserable circumstances with regard to the fruits of the earth this year. And it will be as much as said inhabitants can do and will be beyond the capacity of many to repair their buildings and provide sustenance for themselves and their cattle this year. And as said, said parish is but a poor place and said inhabitants are at a considerable charge among themselves over and above the province tax, which in itself is very heavy, and considering the circumstances of said parish will be insurmountable as their dependence is 
on the fruits of the earth, which are now destroyed. Wherefore, the said James Martin and Joseph Philbrook pray on behalf of the said parish that your excellency and honors will take care of the said inhabitants into your wise consideration and relieve said inhabitants by abating the whole or so much as said province tax as your excellency and honors in your great wisdom shall think expedient and your petitioners in behalf of said inhabitants as in duly bound shall ever pray james martin and joseph philbrook in council read and ordered to be sent down to the honorable general assembly Neither the provincial nor the town records give any further information in regard to this matter or whether the prayer of the selectman was granted from which it is reasonable to infer that it was not. Not dissimilar to the times that we are facing right now, folks. I would advise you to pick up the book because this chapter goes on. I will just tell you that what we are missing because you'd have to drink a whole bottle of wine to get through the rest of this with me is there's conversation about various storms and the dates. Um, it goes on about the graveyards and the interment of graveyards um, as people moved out of the area or onto um, larger properties and the beginnings of the Central Cemetery, which was um, requested by the town and of that note, uh, we will be doing a live cemetery tour a week from today at 1 p.m. So join us on our Facebook Live for the Central Cemetery Live Tour. Um, we also have information about those private graveyards that were disinterred and what remains are still there. Um, you can have a self-guided tour. Uh, and that is all at the Historical Society. Um, there's more information on the receiving vault, a hearse and the hearse house. House. The chapter continues on about, actually there's one other thing I did want, earthquakes that were here in New England. The dark day. I'm going to finish with the dark day. The 19th day of May, 1780, was unprecedented in New England for its great darkness. Belknap says it presented a complete specimen of as total darkness as can be conceived. The darkness became noticeable, noticeable about 11 o'clock and it soon became necessary to have lights. Fowls went to roost and the cattle collected around the barnyards. For some days previous, the air had been filled with smoke, probably arising from vast forest fires. September 6, 1881 was known as a yellow day. The sun was obscured and lights needed at midday. I did a little research. So the dark day, it was discovered um, in 2007 the, through the University of Missouri's research that due to low barometric barometric pressure that fires that had gone underground up in southern Ontario, that's what created the dark day. And people back then in 1780 considered this to be probably a sign of judgment day coming. So they were very fearful. Uh, Continuing on, the chapter got, talks about stores, the first carriages, mail service, and the postmasters. Physicians, there was a physician that um, took service here for 50 years and very beloved. It talks about the beginning of the Abenaki Golf Club in 1890, oh, no, sorry, 1899, but when it was incorporated in 1903 talks about the Rockingham County Light and Power Company, the mills, which I regret I can't read to you. So the mills off of the various streams and here in Rye, Bells, the town hall, the public library, which that's really interesting. It's about the sleeper legacy, sleeper being um, somebody who granted money for a library to be erected, which never happened until the 1900s by, I've forgotten the lady's name, but a woman who bequeathed monies and the property for the Rye Public Library. 
and that wraps up the industrial and miscellaneous chapter. So I apologize for not being able to get through all of that, but this is available. Uh, the book is available for purchase at the Rye Historical Society. You could email us through info at rye New Hampshire Historical Society.org. My name is Debbie Tui. Thank you for listening, sitting with me. Happy Mother's Day to everybody. Have a great afternoon and evening. See you later.